again, Richard Hersfeld for appellant. The first, the first issue which I would like to address is the several issues regarding appellant's right to counsel. Uh, these began when appellants retained counsel mid-trial, made an oral application to be relieved based upon what he described as a breakdown in communications. Uh, in point of fact, as appellant documented with an email, it was strictly an issue of non-payment of fees. Uh, first of all, the court should not have accepted the oral application and an appellant should have been given an opportunity to address a, a written motion uh, which spelled out what counsel was claiming and what appellant's position was. Uh, and second of all, the, the law is well settled that mid-trial, the court does not relieve counsel simply based on uh, non-payment of fees. Uh, the AFC argues that appellant had discharged counsel uh, and therefore uh, there was no error there, but in fact, appellant specifically stated that he wanted counsel to proceed, but counsel had told him, and the email reflects that, that counsel would not proceed uh, unless his bill had been paid. Uh, this is also a, a good time to address uh, whether the AFC should be heard here at all. Uh, as set forth in the reply brief, uh, the, uh, the rules and case law is well settled that the AFC must uh, advocate for the child's wishes unless the child is incapable of expressing them. Uh, while the court allowed the AFC to substitute judgment when the child was much younger, uh, she's now nine and a half years old, uh, the testimony was she was intelligent, uh, outspoken, uh, knew her mind, and could speak her mind. So, and, and there's nothing in the AFC's brief to, to bring the court up to date on, on what those wishes are to date. Throughout the trial, consistently, her wishes were to be with appellant, uh, and it is submitted that uh, without uh, some indication of either that the AFC is promoting her wishes or that there's some reason why at this point in time the AFC would be permitted to uh, substitute judgment, the, the AFC should not be heard. And uh, I would also ask the court that if the, I don't know what the AFC is going to say uh, in her oral argument. Wasn't there some, counsel, wasn't there some evidence that uh, your client was impermissibly influencing the child in terms of the child's statements to the court? No, I don't know that it was in terms of the child's statements. I think the, the testimony was more bad-mouthing uh, the mother. And I don't think there was anything to show that he was exerting his will over her to the extent that uh, he was basically forcing her to say that she wanted to be with him. Uh, the neutral said that she was outspoken, knew her mind, and spoke her mind. So, uh, Counsel, and, and what, what should the court, when, when this application came up, what should the court have done, uh, if anything? Your counsel indicated uh, he was prepared to proceed pro se, and I think the judge was concerned. This was, what, his third lawyer? Uh, he, obviously, he obviously could afford lawyers. He had hired three already. What should the court have done before allowing your client to proceed pro se, if anything? Judge, judge I, I would respectfully disagree with the statement that he was obviously could afford lawyers because his attorney was quitting because he wasn't being paid. Well, let, let's just go back to the question of this was his third lawyer. I think the judge may have been concerned that he was trying to delay the trial. What, if anything, the judge should have, should have done before allowing your client to proceed pro se? If you could focus on that. Okay, but uh, just one more statement. Appellant said he wanted to continue with the lawyer. So it wasn't the appellant's attempt to delay things. It was the lawyer's insistence on being paid. What the court should have done is explained, and we have case law in the brief, should have explained to appellant that if he was going to proceed pro se, there are certain risks and dangers involved and make sure that appellant understood that before he made that decision. Even if you assume that appellant had the ability to pay, then he still had the ability at that point to say, okay, uh, now that I understand what it takes to go pro se, I'm going to pay my lawyer and let him continue because I really don't want to undertake the risks and the obligations of going pro se. There was absolutely no inquiry uh, in, in that regard, and that, that's exactly what the court should have done. Uh, now, uh, the AFC argues that it was up to appellant to say, I want a, a signed count. Oh, and, 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 and also, putting aside pro se, the, the, the court really, despite, you know, 
your statement that appellant had the ability to pay for lawyers, you know, we, we see that he didn't. Uh, throughout the, the hearing, uh, there are several instances where appellant said he was on disability. He got 3000 a month. He's got his attorney saying he wasn't being paid. You've got the AFC saying she wasn't being paid. You've got issues with the forensic neutral not being paid. Uh, the court should have explored whether or not appellant was aware of and and, uh, and eligible for a signed counsel. And, and there was none of that, which basically forced appellant to proceed pro se. And to the extent that the AFC argues it was incumbent upon appellant to say, I want to sign counsel, that, that's simply not the law. So with all three of those issues, uh, it's submitted that uh, appellant was denied his right to counsel. The, the second issue I'd like to address is uh, the determination that custody should be changed to the mother. Uh, the first question there is whether having entered into an agreement in family court just three months before, uh, there could possibly have been uh, a showing of changed circumstances which would warrant a hearing on the issue. And I think the record, you know, evidence is that there wasn't. The, the, the issues that the AFC raises in support of changed circumstances uh, all existed but one, uh, all existed before the, the family court uh, order. Uh, appellant, any you know, alleged uh, psychological issues with appellant, they, they didn't just come about. Uh, any issues regarding alienation or domestic violence, they didn't just come about. As, as far as domestic violence goes, the, the court, this court, other courts have all indicated that you know, once there's a separation and, and there's no continuation of that violence, uh, then it's not as big a factor as if they were, it was still going on. Uh, but that aside, for purposes of whether there should have been a hearing, uh, there's certainly no change in the three months since the, uh, the custody order was entered into. What you basically have Council, is, when did the CPS investigations uh, take place? The, uh... I believe that, that was post-order. Uh, but again, the CPS investigations, although the AFC says appellant admitted to those, he absolutely did not. What he admitted to was an occasional, uh, a handful of welfare checks, which he called in because he explained that the mother w was not complying with the order, wouldn't tell appellant uh, where she was, where, where, where the child was, or what was going but on. But wasn't the and court concerned about the impact that these uh, investigations were having on the child, and as much as investigators were showing up, and uh, that it was detrimental to the best interest of the child to have this sort of thing going on? The, the court may have been concerned about that, but there was, there was absolutely no testimony of that. No, nobody said one word about the child being present, the child being affected, the child being upset. It was just that, you know, these were going on, these were happening, but there was no testimony to support any claim that uh, this was affecting the child. Uh, in, in, in some, and, and, you know, to the extent that the AFC argues that, you know, this is waived because the appellant didn't appeal the interim order, well, that, 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 that's just not the law. To the extent she argues that it was waived because the appellant uh, didn't object to it at the outset. Um, if you take a look at uh, the transcript of August 25th, uh, at page 10, uh, appellant says he's not even challenging the custody order at this point. And at page 14, the court says to, to the mother, I didn't even know you that was an issue for you. So, I mean, how can an appellant object to something, which, and, and there's no written motion, which, which, again, uh, so, I mean, how can an appellant object or even defend it when, when, when there's really no target to hit? You, you don't know what she's alleging because there's no written motion. The court didn't even know she was alleging it. So to, to engage in a hearing on this was completely inappropriate. If the court concludes that the hearing was appropriate, it submitted that, you know, the evidence adduced uh, did not support the change of custody. Uh, on the one hand, You've got appellant as the sole caregiver. You've got the child thriving. You've got her wishes. You've got the fact that this would turn into a relocation, which the court completely ignored in, in, in its analysis with the child being, uh, although it was not far away, there was still testimony that it was as much as an hour and a half. It affected the child appellant 
visitation where it could no longer be 50 50 these were all issues which you know should have been considered and, and were factors in favor of appellant on, on, on the other side of the ledger once again you've got the domestic violence which preceded the separation so is not as big a concern uh, appellants mental health issues there was no showing uh, other than you know the uh, forensics uh, analysis after very brief meetings with appellant. Uh, there's really. No I was going to ask evidence. you about that, counsel. The forensic evaluator. How does that testimony okay. affect any of this? Well, well, well again, we, we we argue, and and the AFC ignores the arguments that there were a variety of infirmities with the forensic evaluator's report. Uh, you can start with the fact, which you know goes back to appellant's ability to pay, that you know the court directed that basically the evaluator proceed without him if he wasn't to pay. And again, appellant stated time and again, he couldn't afford it. And at that point, it was really incumbent upon the court uh, to advise appellant that if he was eligible, the county would pay for it and to make the necessary arrangements. So what you ended up with was a completely disjointed report where first you interview the mother uh, and then you interview appellant way down the road where you can ask the appellant about what the mother said, but I guess the forensic evaluator has time limits built into her procedures for whatever fee she charges. She wouldn't interview the mother again to ask her about appellant's allegations. So they remained unaddressed. You've got her uh, random rule that she will not travel out of state, even though, again, this was a short distance. You can travel much further within the state than you had to to go to Pennsylvania to, to check out the, the mother's living circumstances, the environment, uh, particularly, again, this is a relocation. Uh, the child is being uprooted from the only home she knew, the only community she knew. She's being taken to a new community, and the evaluator didn't have a clue as to what that community was like, what the school system's like, what the healthcare system's like. None of that was addressed by the evaluator. And then you've got the various issues regarding uh, the court's refusal to allow appellant to examine the evaluator about uh, the inconsistent statements that uh, the mother made uh, regarding, you know, first of all, and, and, and most apparent as to whether the mother was uh, basically assaulting the mind with, with, with prejudicial uh, untrue testimony. You've got her claim, you know, sudden claim at trial that appellant forced sex upon her. And you've got her statement to the evaluator that they had random, you know, they, they had sporadic sex maybe twice a month. Uh, you can't reconcile those two statements, and, and that was a significant uh, misstatement by the mother that the court would not allow appellant to cross-examine the mother about because in the court's opinion, it wasn't uh, relevant to custody. Well, I mean, how can that not be relevant to custody if the mother's lying about something like that? You've got the mother's college essay uh, where she said... Okay, but, okay, Counselor, you're really beginning to talk about what is Yes, it is credibility, so these are collateral issues. So I'm going to stop you there and ask you if there's anything else that you want to add that you haven't said before because it's time to wrap it up. Okay, yes, there, there are two things I'd like to say. First of all, the refusal to allow appellant to call the, uh, the child's therapist based upon alleged privilege, but privilege had been waived. And, and in fact, these were joint sessions often with appellant and the therapist. There was no privilege to assert, and if there was, it had been waived by the mother when the therapist spoke to the uh, the evaluator. So uh, clearly, uh, the child's therapist would have a much better sense of the child's mental state, what was going on, whether or not there was undue influence on her. Uh, she was critical to appellant's case, and and, and the, the denial of appellant's request to call her. Uh, based on a privilege which, you know, was already waived or didn't exist, it was basic and fundamental error. Uh, lastly, I just want to note that, you know, if the court chooses to affirm, you still have the issue of visitation, which was never spelled out uh, by the court. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, Your Honors. Kelly O'Brien, I'm the attorney for the child in this matter. And... Um, uh, the main issue that I wanted to address um, before going back, I guess, and responding to some of the allegations that were just made is that my concern as the AFC in this case was that the trial court, despite having made a finding that there was domestic violence and finding that that was credible, 
At the end of the day, the court ordered joint custody. And there's a serious concern for me after hearing the nature of the testimony and the very clear and very credible allegations that the mother had made in this case about the way she had been treated by the father, that the possibility of joint custody and the ability to communicate is, is simply not there. And in the end, what it creates um, and what it created in this case was the use of that joint custody as a sword instead of a methodology by which there could be participation in the child's life. And the court disregarded that by directing joint custody here where there's obviously such an inability to communicate that the level of hostility um, that was clearly evident in the courtroom and I don't think can ever come through on a transcript was so palpable that it's this is one of those cases where the law says joint custody is inappropriate in domestic violence cases for good reason. This is one of those cases. Um, counsel, so if you would just uh, counsel, it's Judge Miller. If you would just address briefly um, this, I think your colleague on the other side indicated that you were advocating a position different from the child. How old is the child now, and when did you last speak to the child? I, I spoke to my client as recently as last evening when she returned home from a weekend visit with her dad, which she enjoyed. Um, and I continue at this point to advocate for her expressed wishes. Um, she is content with the current arrangement. She enjoys her time with her dad, but she also um, enjoys her life with her mom. Um, at this point in time, one of the things that was so apparent, um, at least during the in-camera, which it is true that counsel doesn't have the benefit of that. Um, and, and it is also true that my client is now four years older than when I first met her. And there has been an evolution of her demeanor and evolution of her ability to express herself as you would expect with any child, uh, you know, as basically their lifespan has doubled in that time period. Um, my client first presented as is articulated by the forensic with a, with a bullet point list of points that she seemed to be required to regurgitate. Once those points were regurgitated, she then moved on and was very responsive to the sort of typical questions an attorney may have for a child her age or the conversation that you may have with a child her age. And although she would be very adamant in those bullet points that things were very black and white, when asked from a different direction about things and when she wasn't regurgitating what she, and she was very, very good at regurgitating exactly what she was told to regurgitate. She was, she was very comfortable um, talking about the good things that she experienced with both of her parents. So what again might be lost in the, um, the, the, the forensic report, I'm pretty sure my recollection of the, the interview that I had with Valentina and with Judge Onofre, um, it was very clear that she she had a to-do list and she was very stressed about making sure she said the things that she was supposed to say. But then once you were able to engage her in conversation, much of that dissipated. Um, Counsel, if you, that, I, I understand your position. Could you though comment on one of, I think that is the first issue that your colleague raised, which is that the judge uh, did not follow the law uh, when uh, his client uh, proceeded pro se, that there wasn't uh, a sufficient warning, there wasn't a sufficient colloquy about understanding the dangers and risk. That's probably the thrust of the strongest uh, argument to get a reversal here, forgetting the back and forth dynamic of what the facts are. Could you comment as to why what the judge did was, was appropriate under these circumstances, if you can? Certainly. I, I, th I think I was there and I experienced it. So yeah, I, I think I can express what it appeared to me was occurring. Um, it was, first of all, counsel repeatedly indicates that, um, that the appellant was unable to pay. The fact that somebody has outstanding bills does not mean that they have chosen not to pay them. What was evident in this case on several occasions was that the appellant for example, prior to my involvement in the case, if you review the transcripts when the prior attorney for the child was involved, he had not paid that person. But then when it appeared that that was going to be a negative impact on his presentation in the case, at a court appearance, he pulls $1,000 out of his pocket to make a payment on that account. One of the things that was of issue and also noted by the court 
was that while appellant had not paid his bill in advance of one of those court appearances, one of the issues and one of the motions before the court was a request for a passport because the appellant had traveled to Peru and apparently purchased plane tickets in excess of $2,000 for himself and the child. So in those situations, while counsel now is looking back retroactively and saying he was unable to afford it, none of that is depicted in the record. In addition, the evidence um, referenced by um, by one of his own witnesses, what, that, he, that he did in fact have resources available, he had assets available. So here with all of that, back to your question, I swear I'm going to answer it here at some point, um, back to the, what, what did the judge do and what could he have done differently? This judge had heard the case from the very beginning. This judge, I think, had observed what, um, I'm sorry, not from the beginning, um, from, from the beginning of the, of the, the period right before the trial. So, so let me stop you for a moment. Um, my thought is that very often when defendants go pro se, they're very headstrong. There, there's no question about that. Um, so doesn't the court still have a responsibility to warn the defendant of um, the, the, the problems with going pro se? I think on this particular occasion, Mr. B the, the appellant arrived for that court appearance armed with an advocate um, from, who identified himself on the record. Um, but, he, and, but, he, but he wasn't a lawyer. That person was not a lawyer. So That know. was not at first because he seemed to assert himself as a lawyer. And Mr. Brandel appeared to be um, making very clear and concise arguments um, where he had the assistance, of, uh, I assume, of this advocate, but not quite lawyer, um, in order to make those kinds of arguments. It is very clear from the record that Mr. Brandel was well prepared to make the arguments that he wanted to make. Yes, um, but, you, but, but we often say that, you know, it's still extremely difficult uh, to advocate on your own behalf, especially when we're talking about issues uh, that you feel very strongly about. So, um, you know, it still comes back to the same thing. What responsibility did the court have in warning him that there were, it was a slippery slope um, defending himself? And you're saying she had none. That's, that's I, I, I think I think he was he was warned in the initial colloquy with Judge Onofre that his discharging his lawyer because again there's a question as to whether or not he initiated the discharge or whether or not the attorney asked to be relieved as much as there was an email about finances again suggesting that because there was an outstanding bill meant there's an inability to pay it could just be a choice not to pay um, that being said here the it was not until um, the appellant's failure to pay court-ordered fees, um, did the appellant ever request counsel? Did the appellant ever say, I want an appointed attorney? Previously, what he said is, all of my lawyers have not done a good job for me. None of these lawyers get what I'm about, and none of these lawyers are doing what I tell them to do. So with that position coming from the appellant before the trial court, Sure, the court could have read a sheet of warnings, but this appellant doesn't listen to anything that the court had said. He wasn't listening to many of the orders. The court could have read, read a rote, you know, warning, statutory warning to this appellant, but I suspect, like so many other things, it would have fallen on, on his very, very deaf ears. Okay, so is there anything else that you'd like to add that you haven't said before? Um, I think just a few things in response to um, what appellant's counsel um, had indicated on the issue of domestic violence and when it's asserted, the statute is very clear that domestic violence is what this court is supposed to consider. It does not put a time limit on it. And domestic violence is clearly a continuum of behavior. The evidence or the testimony provided by the appellant compounded with, I'm sorry, the respondent compounded with the appellant's behavior right through this appeal um, is evidence of that domestic violence as an ongoing continuum. Um, and it certainly is not limited, again, right up to the point during the record where the appellant offered nude and provocative photographs of the mother, um, suggesting that that was somehow evidence that he had not raped her, that that was somehow a defense um, to his having sexually assaulted her. Um, all of those things can become a part of that continuum of domestic violence that is so harmful 
for children to be observing and experiencing. Um, as far as uh, the CPS investigations, the court had asked, you know, what, what the duration of that was. The, the record indicates and the forensic report indicates that those CPS investigations began as far back as 2014 when both parents were the subject of an indicated CPS report because of violence occurring in the household. Beyond that, subsequent to um, the, the, the end of this trial, the appellant has availed himself of the Child Protective Agencies in Pennsylvania. And there have been reports to Child Protective Services such that my client is regularly interviewed, whether it's at school, whether it's at her home, and these questions are constantly interjected and she is put through the process of essentially being forced to take a position as between her parents and questioning which, you know, what story she's supposed to be telling at any point in time. That ongoing CPS involvement is definitely harmful to my clients and harmful to, to any child. So I think that those were the key points that, that I needed to make in response to, um, to what appellant's counsel had to say. And as I sit here today, I am no longer taking a position of substituted judgment. I think there's a, the problem inherently with appeals um, and cases that span almost five years now is that the child has grown and is fully capable of expressing her wishes to me. I'm not expressing anything today that is contrary to her wishes. She at her age is still not capable of understanding truly the differences between soul and joint uh, custody and that kind of a thing. So that is not something that I'm weighing in on her behalf. I'm weighing in you know, as a lawyer on those issues. Okay, we have your argument. Thank you both.